I said, General, there's no way I can make it down that ramp without falling on my ass, General. Falling on my ass, General. It had no handrail. It was like an ice skating ring. So I took these little steps. I ran down because I'm wearing leather bottom shoes, which is good if you're walking on flat surfaces. It's not good for ramps. I'll tell you what, there's something wrong with Biden that I can tell. You know what, Trump? I'll give it to you on that one. There's definitely something wrong with Joe Biden. Those clips for this week's remix were from Trump's uh, Tulsa rally. If you want to see more highlights of it, check out the video I made on Bedrino Politics on Facebook and all the other platforms. Uh, I made a little music video, let's just say, about Trump's night in Tulsa. Welcome to the Bedrino Politics Podcast. I'm your host, Kiefer, aka Bedrino, and this week we're back uh, after our Black Lives Matter episode two weeks ago and my brief hiatus before that because of the 20,000 word term paper I had to write. Um, we're back on regular scheduling uh, and I have a kind of big announcement to make at the start of the show today. We have our first supporter for the Bedrino Politics podcast. I'd like to thank Miss Rajay for her generous support of the podcast. Uh, that's over on Patreon if anyone wants to head over there. Um, I do have some news about that, though, because uh, it looks like, as a part of this, the Bedrino Politics podcast has been approached by a Flat Earth Lobby Group, and, uh, well, you're not going to believe this, but uh, I think the show is going to be sponsored by a Flat Earth Group now, a Flat Earth Lobby Group. So, we're going to shift the content of today's show, and uh, we're going to be talking about the legitimacy of whether the Earth is flat. And there's a lot of things we can talk about here, right? Like the moon landing, I don't know, that kind of looked like it was done in a studio in LA. And uh, a lot of those pictures from space, if you look at them from a certain angle, they kind of look like they were photoshopped. Okay, I'm just kidding, I'm, that's not happening. <laughs> the, the show is not going to be a Flat Earth podcast. But thanks to Miss Rajay for her generous support of the show. Um, that's really helping me make this, take this kind of from a hobby and eventually someday turn it into some sort of profession and job. And I think it is really important to support independent media in Canada because it doesn't really matter if you're liberal, conservative, whatever, Canada's mainstream media is pretty bad overall. Um, and Canada's mainstream media just typically tends to favor what's in their best interest. So the more small independent media outlets there are, the better journalism we can do to make uh, Canada's democracy more democratic, more transparent, and uh, better representative of the people that live here. So today's episode is going to be about electoral politics, specifically Canada's electoral political system. Uh, I'm basing this off of various courses I've taken in university in political science, as well as I actually have taken a fourth year course that was completely dedicated to electoral politics. Um, I'm not just going to regurgitate information from that course. I'm going to kind of go beyond that with um, more different types of research I've done and different concepts with electoral politics. But I will use some stuff um, I learned from that kind of as a basis to talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, three topics today. Uh, I'm going to quickly break down how Canada's electoral system works right now. Um, then I'm going to talk about... Canada's democracy, I guess what I tend to call narrowing theory about how democratic Canada actually is, how many people actually participate in our democracy. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about the different types of models and the different types of systems that other countries use, because uh, as we're going to talk about today, um, Canada's electoral system is quite old. Um, it's quite out of date. It's not modern. It's not as democratic as it could be. So first off, what is Canada's electoral system and how does it work? Canada is a constitutional monarchy, um, which sounds like a really complicated word. All it basically means is that uh, the Queen doesn't 
sort of has power over Canada, but for our laws to be passed in Canada, we have a governor general who has to sign them into law, and that governor general is representative of the crown. Uh, the British monarchy still has a role in Canadian democracy. It's not huge, it's not big, but it still is a part of Canadian democracy. Uh, whereas a place like the United States is a republic, it's different. Um, they, they hate the Queen uh, a lot more than Canada does. And the Queen does not have any kind of um, even representation in their democratic system. So Canada, like I just said, is a constitutional monarchy. And primarily because of that, we use an electoral system called first past the post. Or in short, you'll see it mostly written as FPTP. Um, haha, TP toilet paper, uh, cause it's shit. <laughs> but that system, um, is a system that is used around the world. It's not used as frequently anymore. It's been replaced by other systems such as proportional representation and the more advanced, um, systems such as like majority runoff or like, there's like all these different types like Van Hond. There's all these like equations actually with uh, different types of democratic um, electoral systems. First past the post primarily is an older one. Uh, Canada uses it. The United States sort of uses it. Um, the UK uses it. India uses it. Um, I think certain African countries use it. Uh, a lot of European countries don't use it um, nowadays. Uh, yeah, I can't, I'm, try I'm just looking here to see if I, there's some countries in Africa um, but besides that, it's pretty much a relatively outdated system. Um, but the way it works simply is basically you usually have a riding um, that has like a regional jurisdiction, such as, um, I don't know, like Ottawa. They have like, uh, let's say, Canada. Canada is like a neighborhood in Ottawa, basically its own town. And it has its own jurisdiction. And basically all those people in that specific area go out and vote and they elect a representative to represent them in parliament. And you do that all across the country. And in Canada, there's currently 338 different ridings. Um, that number's changed over time with different populations and stuff like that. Obviously a major flaw with that is how you draw those ridings, right? You can do them in certain ways to favor uh, your political party or your political ideology, um, the way these regions typically tend to be divided, because they're usually divided by, like, uh, cities, which are essentially corporations, because um, they're incorporated, and they have these jurisdictional areas based. It's a complicated process, but there, there's, there is a clear problem there, usually, um, because of that. It is easier it's, to manipulate that stuff. Now, it's not as bad as, like, the states with manipulating that kind of stuff, but um, there are problems with the way Canada's ridings work, but that being said, there's 338 ridings, and to get a majority government, you need 170 seats. And our political system, our electoral system, is based off of majority. Um, majority governments are much more common in Canada, and if we do have minority governments, they don't last very long compared to... Uh, like our majority governments compared to other countries, we tend to have a lot more. Um, that's because of our voting system. Different voting systems uh, basically have different, they result in different typical results. So first past the post, you usually do get um, more majority governments. And under proportional representation, where essentially everyone just votes, whoever has the most votes wins across the country, there's no re regional jurisdictions. Under that system, that typically tends to favor uh, minority governments that are multi-party coalitions that work together to uh, govern. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages and disadvantages about each system. I'll get more into that in the third uh, topic of the show. But basically, that's kind of just a summary of how our electoral system works. Um, hopefully, everyone's voted. Uh, if you haven't, I suggest the next time an election happens, you do go and vote. But when you go and vote, you are voting for that regional area. You're voting for a regional representative to go to parliament for you. Um, and sometimes part of that that can be confusing to some people, actually, that I've talked to, like, because I've worked with a lot of different people over the years. 
And some people don't like always get the fact that they're electing a representative for their area and they're electing a representative that is basically um, supposed to be kind of like representative to that area. Some people seem to think that like, oh, I'm voting for Trudeau essentially, or I'm voting for Andrew Scheer, or I'm voting for Jagmeet Singh. And that's not really how it works. Um, you are voting for your regional representative who goes to parliament. The issue in Canada is that regional representative basically has to listen to what their party tells them to. And parties have party whips, which is some kind of weird fucking kinky... I don't know who came up with that term. I don't know if it has anything to do with whipping or God knows if there's a shitty history to that. I don't know. But basically, uh, if you're a mem MP for the Liberal Party, you can't go out and vote against the Liberal Party budget uh, that comes out, right? You'll get kicked out of the party. Um, and we typically see under first past the post, we see a lot of people kind of, they basically kind of talk about this like, oh, this is your local representative, but it's your local representative doesn't really actually do that much for your community. Um, they might go to certain events or they might uh, have power over funding of a certain, you know, community center or something like federal funding for that sake. But um, overall, a lot of the times your representative doesn't even fucking live in that area. Like, or they, sorry, they usually live in that area, but they haven't lived there a long time. Um, they don't usually even know a lot about that area. A lot of the times, uh, when parties are choosing who to run, they just kind of figure out, okay, who's who has the best chance of running. So that's one of my major issues I have with First Past the Post is people act like there's this kind of um, regional benefit to it of having a regional representative. And they say like, oh, I don't want proportional representation because then I won't have a representative. You could still have a representative for your area under proportional representation. Um, you could still do that. Uh, those things don't have to be different than each other. Um, but that being said, that's just basically a basic summary of how Canada's electoral system works. Um, obviously, uh, the party with the most votes governs, and there's a difference between a majority government mi or a minority government. Majority government is over 170 seats, and essentially when that happens, you have 100% of the power. Uh, if you get 171 seats, you have you can do whatever the fuck you want, basically. And if you have 169 seats, which may sound nice, but you don't, and your government can get defeated uh, much easier um, than a majority government. Because a majority government, they could still fall. If it's close on the line and like some MPs resign or stuff like that, um, you know, that stuff does happen. Uh, but that's a big important part of our electoral system is a majority versus a minority government. And I'm gonna go into some research that I've actually done later uh, from my uh, hit paper that I got an A on called It's Time to Ghost First Past the Post. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll talk about some research I did with that and um, just some dis some really undemocratic disadvantages of the First Past the Post system and uh, why I think that like literally any other system would basically be better. So topic number two is going to be about Canada's democracy and specifically this thing that I like to call narrowing theory. Now, what does narrowing theory mean? Well, just picture a big tunnel that starts out big and it gets more and more and more narrow. That's what this theory that I've kind of created is basically is you start off with 100% of people that live in a country and the, through the electoral process, the further you go on, the less people participate in democracy and there's numerous not only just barriers that stop them from participating in democracy, but the system itself stops people from actively participating in democracy um, on a regular basis. And that simply just comes from the fact that we vote every four years. Um, I don't think that that's enough. I think voting should happen more, uh, should happen more frequently, but that too, there should be more consultations with Canadians um, through things like direct democracy, through things like uh, basically there's there's some debates around direct democracy, but things like referendums, things like that. The United States actually has more of that. Um, when you go to vote, you vote for a lot. You do a lot more on voting day in, in the United States than you do in Canada. 
um, if you're voting in the primaries or you're voting um, for like your representative, sometimes there'll be a referendum on it, right? And they'll be like, okay, do we want to legalize weed? Do we want to change the voting age? Do we want to do stuff like that? There are referendums that happen more often. In Canada, we basically don't do referendums. Um, it happened with Quebec, uh, with the Quebec separation twice, but it doesn't really happen that often in Canada. And it, it happened in Australia, uh, but I think it was about gay marriage. They did a really terrible job. They sent out all the letters and there was a big conspiracy. So that's, that is what it is. So to start off with narrowing theory, Canada has 37 million people inside the country. Um, I believe the ratio of eligible voters to registered voters is like 0 0.89. Um, so basically you're looking at like 10% of people aren't registered. Um, those numbers are kind of hard to kind of hard to find because um, it is kind of hard to track because you're just basically going off the census information and then comparing it to the registered voters list. But I do believe it's around there from what I could find. Uh, out of the 37 million people in Canada, I believe it's somewhere around 30 million people are older than 18. Um, there's a lot of people in there that will fit into the threshold of being 16 to 18, which I do think 16 year olds, uh, 17 year olds should be able to vote. Um, Primarily because when I was young, I knew a lot about politics. Uh, I, I was able to name every prime minister and something they did in like grade five. And uh, I found it frustrating that I couldn't participate in democracy when I was like an 11, even when I was an 11 year old, I was frustrated because I knew I talked to adults about politics and a lot of adults like didn't know much at all. And it really frustrated me, but I'm not, okay. I'm not saying drop the voting age to 11, but 16, I mean, 16 is an age where uh, I think you should be able to vote, especially considering like when you look at people in Canada, a lot of people have absolutely no fucking idea about politics when they go and vote. And usually 16 year olds are much more politically engaged than adults, um, especially when you lower that threshold. It shows studies have shown in the past that um, it gets younger people more interested in democracy. It helps with voting rates. It helps with other stuff like that. Um, and it's easier too, because when you're in elementary school, sorry, not elementary school, uh, high school, when you're in uh, high school, it's easier to get someone to register to vote um, than it is if they're outside of school and they're in a workplace or something. But Canadian voter turnout typically tends to be around 60 to 70 percent. It depends the time. Voter turnout over the last 50 years has declined as less people have had faith in the political system. That's not just like... Um, an opinion that's a fact in political science. Uh, studies and polls and uh, ethnographies and just various types of evidence over the last 50 years have shown, along with the participation rates of uh, like how many people participate in elections, that people have been more distrusting over the political system over time, and that contributes to why less people vote. Um, that and on top of that, um, barriers to voting. With that being said, so you start off with that figure, you know, 37 million people in Canada, 30 million people who can vote. And already, you know, you take 10% off of that of people who just don't register to vote. And then you take uh, 30 to 40% off of that of people who um, can't, who don't go out to vote on election day. And already you're looking at a significant amount of Canadians that aren't participating in the Canadian electoral system. And that's a problem. I think that uh, voting should be, you should have to vote. You don't have to, you could vote for no party. It's just, I think everyone should have to fill out a form, well, not a form, fill out their ballot uh, and send it in. You can vote for no one, you can vote for whoever you want. But I do think that that's an important part of democracy. And I think that this culture we have around voting, making it, pe it people's their responsibility, I think that there's problems with that specifically with you know, if you're a homeless person, you just can't vote. If you don't have photo ID, you can't vote. If you don't have a fixed address, you can't vote. Um, there's numerous problems with our voting system of how, you know, people say it's, oh, it's for security. It's for, no, that's not how it works. If you want to commit voter fraud, you can still commit voter fraud. People can still do it. Um, systemically, our system doesn't want poor people or homeless people voting as much because then that would change the people in power. Same thing with the United States. You see that with Donald Trump. He doesn't want the mail-in voting. Look, he mails his vote in. The vice president mails his vote in. 
mail-in voting is just as safe as other types of voting. The issue with mail-in voting is that if voting was more accessible to people, Trump and the Republicans wouldn't win. And that's something that Trump openly admitted it himself, that if they were to have mail-in voting, he would not win. The Republicans would not win. <laughs> to get the Republicans to win, you have to fuck the system, right? It's, that goes back to George Bush and Al Gore when they just didn't count a bunch of black people's votes in Florida. Um, the more people that can vote, usually the more people support Democrats. So to get Republicans to win, you have to do a good job of suppressing voter participation. And that's that's just a fact that that is the way it is. Trump admitted it himself. But um, unfortunately, that's the kind of world we live in. And uh, despite the fact that Canada and the U.S. are considered, you know, democracies, I think that there's many countries around the world that fit under the term flawed democracies because they could work much better than they currently do. But that being said, um, very rarely does a political party win more than 50% of the votes in an election. They might win more than 50% of the seats, but it's pretty rare for a political party to win more than 50% of the vote that of people who uh, went out of el not just sorry, not eligible voters, uh, registered voters who went out to go and vote. So let's say you have 20 million people who go out to vote, it's pretty rare that you have more than 10 million people supporting one party barring like, you know, some kind of big political catastrophe of the previous government or some kind of big cultural shift. Um, it doesn't really happen that much. And in a couple minutes here, I'm going to go over some of the research I did and explain how first past the post works and who it typically tends to favor and um, with some actual like numbers and statistics I gathered from previous Canadian elections. Now, like I said before, um, we're kind of going narrowing down, <laughs> narrowing theory here about, you know, how many people there are in Canada. 30 million people who could vote, and we've already narrowed down a lot of that, right? We've already narrowed down basically like 45% uh, of that or so um, who don't part don't participate in our, in our democracy, but that's just the people who don't participate in our democracy. The other problem is, is you might participate in our democracy, but if you vote for the Green Party, you know, the Green Party gets like 6% of uh, votes in Canada, but they don't, they get like 0.3% of the seats, or I think right now it's probably around, it's, yeah, it's probably around there. It's, it's like point something. It's under 1%, I think, because there's only like three MPs that are green, I think, right now in federal parliament. Um, but there's a big problem there, right? Because it's not just the people who don't participate in democracy, it's the people who do participate in democracy, but they are their votes, the way your system works, isn't going to where they should be. Um, and we'll get into that in a couple minutes here with the research I've shown. But basically, Canadian elections are, it's very rare a party wins a majority and actually got a majority of the votes. They always get this boost, which I call first past the post boost, which is a certain percentage boost of the actual votes they got and the seats they got, right? So when I'm comparing those two things, I'm comparing the amount of votes they got the party got in an election compared to the amount of seats they got. And a lot of the times what happens is you get like 30%, 35% of the votes, and then you get 50% of the seats, which translates to if you get 50, well, more than 50, 51%, if you get more than 170 seats, you essentially get 100% of the power. And 100% of the power is really bad because that means basically for four years, you can do whatever you want and it's pretty much useless to have opposition parties and question period and debates and stuff like that because it doesn't matter. The government can do whatever the fuck they want unless there's a giant scandal or something that happens or the Senate decides. I forget what the rate the Senate uh, declines bills at, but I think it's like 2%. The Senate very rarely shoots down bills, and if they do... Um, they usually ask it for it to be reformed. It's pretty rare that that happens. Um, it does happen occasionally, but it's, it's, it's not that important. But this is a major problem of first past the post is you get these parties that don't typically 
get more than 50% of the vote, but it's not only that they get, you know, 53% of the seats, it's they essentially get 100% of the power because our political system is majority based. And if you have a majority, you have 100% of the power. It's not like a budget and parliament like other systems has to have 60 or 70% of the vote to pass. It's right at 50. And that typically tends to contribute to a pattern in Canada, which I like to call the bipartisan flip-flop, which basically since the Canada started as a country, you've only really had two parties in power. Um, you've had different types of opposition parties, but basically since Canada was started, you basically only have liberals and conservatives. Um, the conservative party didn't split, it kind of merged uh, with Harper. You had the progressive conservatives merge with uh, the reform of the Canadian Alliance, but that progressive conservative party goes all the way back. It ties back into uh, you know Canada's original conservative party, it ties back to John A. Macdonald. So that being said though, our political system is definitely the biggest, you know, factor that results in that pattern. Um, if we had a different political electoral system here, uh, we wouldn't have that, right? The liberals and the, the conservatives wouldn't have governed for, um, you know, over 150 years. That, that just wouldn't have happened. But unfortunately, we, we've got this shitty electoral system, which is the name of this episode, why Canada's electoral system is shitty. And it results in... In that, and typically uh, post World War II, we usually see a pattern of the Liberals have been the dominant party. The Liberals in Canada, in general, have always kind of been the natural governing party of Canada. And over time, um, when they lose, it's usually because they have a scandal, and then it kind of has to be a perfect storm for a right wing part, well, the Conservatives, to gain power federally. And we can see that with Brian Mulroney and Stephen Harper uh, as recent examples. We see that as Brian Mulroney got elected because a lot of Canadians hated Trudeau and John Turner. They were sick of Trudeau Sr. They had him for too long. Uh, they didn't really like John Turner. And Canada was kind of caught up in these minority governments for a bit. And people just said, okay, we're going to elect Brian Mulroney. And Brian Mulroney is a pretty successful conservative. He had some of the, I believe he had the most dominant conservative uh, government. He won by the most seats at one point. Um, and then the other example here, obviously, is Stephen Harper, uh, who capitalized kind of off of the Jean Chrétien and the Paul Martin years. Um, Canadians fed up with, uh, you know, the political corruption of Jean Chrétien and the austerity of those parties. And then Stephen Harper kind of capitalized on that. It was hard for Harper to get a majority because it's it's harder for conservatives to get majority um, than the liberals, but eventually did. Uh, but that typically tends to be the pattern post World War II. Um, you can even draw that pattern back to Diefenbaker, right? Um, Diefenbaker capitalizing off of long reigning liberals and Diefenbaker coming in and uh, winning. But that being said, Canada's political culture is embedded in our democratic system. And the problem with this is it's not only just, okay, 30% of people voted for this party and they have 100% of the power, but of that 30% of people who voted for the party, they don't always agree with their party, right? And their, elector their elected uh, MPs who go to parliament, those people can't you know, if a writing, let's say uh, the liberals have, um, they're creating a new, um, the liberals are getting rid of green energy or something, let's just say that, and you have a writing like uh, Nepean in Ottawa, and everyone in that writing voted for the liberals, but they support green energy. That liberal MP can't go and vote against his own party unless it's like a private member's bill or unless it's like a not non-significant bill. If it's a significant bill, he's going to get kicked out of his party if that happens. And that's a really problematic element of our democracy because our elected members of parliament can't, they can't represent the people they're supposed to and who voted for them. And even when you look at, you know, like the when the Liberals won a majority in 2015, how many Liberals actually supported the policies of the Liberal Party? Well, it's a very small amount of people who actually support, you know, everything in a party. P politics is much more complicated than 
parties, you can't just put, say, your political ideology and philosophy fits within a party because there's no party in Canada that even itself is consistent, right? The conservative, the liberals, they change their minds all the time on different policies to make what's, you know, basically to, to make things look best for them. So even parties themselves have these huge issues. And even when the party you're voting for gets not even mentioning the waste of votes of the people who don't vote, even the party you're voting for, there's still democratic issues there. And on top of that, we only really vote every like, well, it's usually supposed to be four years, but we vote, we don't vote that often, right? And that in itself is a problem because outside of voting, there really isn't that much participation in our democracy. Now, the government will do consultations with people, but they're half-assed, you know, oh, we're going to do a test study group here. We're going to, you know, like, yeah, it can represent opinions sometimes, but what the government will do is they'll find a group of people, they'll find 1,500 people um, representative of, basically when you do studies, you're trying to take like 1,500 people or whatever amount of people, and you're trying to make up Canada's population with that. So you're trying to narrow it down to a small amount of people that you can send a poll or a questionnaire. You wanna take that data and extrapolate it of how it would apply to the entire country. And when Canada do, does that, it's usually very bad. It's, it's not very um, representative. And we also see that you know, there's many different issues within Canada that majority of the people support, but it doesn't translate into legislation and law. You, right now we're looking at the coronavirus and a majority of, significant majority of Canadians supports uh, creating a wealth tax. I believe it's around 75% or 70% of Canadians support that. Well, Trudeau's not going to do that. And a lot of those people who are saying, who support a wealth tax are liberals. Um, now, obviously, a wealth tax, that's not taxing poor people or middle class people. That's taxing the extremely rich people like Galen Weston and, uh, you know, in the United States, like Jeff Bezos, these people who made billions of dollars off the coronavirus pandemic um, because our governments are so incompetent at dealing with it and our governments don't have the infrastructure. They We've just been using Amazon to ship stuff around and um, that's just absolutely ridiculous, if you ask me, that Canada chose to uh, pay Amazon to do that, use our taxpayer money to pay Amazon to do that when we have a Canadian postal system that is owned by the government um, that actually follows guidelines and stuff like that for the coronavirus. Unlike Amazon, where it's just like you got people dying in the plants because they're it's the working conditions are so absolutely terrible there. Um, but anyways, I digress. Even within the political parties and people who vote for them, a lot of the times your political beliefs do not go into the party and they do not go into legislation. And that creates a large problem because I started off talking about there's 30 million people who could vote. Well, when you break it all down, people who actually get what they want in our democracy, it doesn't really happen. And that's a pretty big problem if you ask me. Now here, I'm gonna look at the small uh, study I did basically of Canadian elections for my term paper. And what I did is I looked at different election years post World War II. Uh, I looked at a bunch of different factors like voter turnout. Uh, voter turnout obviously is just what percentage of registered voters uh, went and voted on a certain election day. Then I looked at the percentage of the vote the a Canadian party got, the one that won. And then I looked at the percentage of seats they got. And then I kind of created this indicator, which I call first past the post boost, which is what percent did that party get boosted by from our electoral system? And, and obviously, how would that compare to a proportional system, right? Because if you had a party that got 41% of the vote in a proportional system like they use in a lot of countries in Europe, that party would get 41% of the seats. And then there would be some kind of minority government or something. But that's pretty important to keep in mind here. What I found was what I expected to find. There is a significant boost that you get from first past the post system. And this manifests itself in Canada in a very specific way because of our political culture here, right? Because we have, like I said, currently right now we have 338 writings. We have all these electoral patterns that typically tend to happen in elections, right? 
And obviously places like Alberta, Saskatchewan tend to be conservative. Southern Ontario tends to be conservative. Urban centers tend to be more liberal. Um, East Coast uh, tends to be like Atlantic Canada always tends to be liberal, liberal stronghold. BC does have a slight favor of the NDP, but BC also does favor liberals in some areas and also conservatives in other areas. Um, and it's important to look, when we look at this, we look at, you know, the history of ridings. And, you know, if a, the liberals were won somewhere for like 40 years in a row, that's a pretty big sign that, okay, this area is very liberal. Um, and there's a whole bunch of demographic patterns and stuff like that that contribute to how that culture works. But Canada doesn't really have, like, our demographics, if you look at stuff like age, the recent polls I've looked at on who people support, I mean, there's a difference. Obviously, young people are a little bit more prone to supporting the NDP, but like young people still are the people act like millennials are this different generation in Canada and they have so much hope um, that they're going to change the political system. Well, the last poll that I looked at had people under 30, 40 percent supporting liberals, 20 percent supporting conservatives, and then the rest was block, cream, NDP. So it's like that's basically the same thing as older people in Canada, just a little bit different ratios there. So Canada, it is important to notice that um, in terms of age demographics, there's there's always some wonky stuff going on there that people don't account for. But back to the main point here about uh, Canadian electoral results under first past the post. I'll post a chart on Twitter. Um, I'll, I might post it as a secondary thing too, if people want to look at that on Instagram, if you want to look at it. But Obviously, we see a typical pattern of voter turnout going down. 1958, voter turnout was 79.4%. 1962, it was 79%. 1963, it was 79%. And recently, it's been like 66, 68, 61, 58 in uh, 2008. I, I remember that election. Um, a lot of people were fed up with uh, the political system at that point. And then you have different... Uh, voter turnout rates. The most important part is this kind of category I invented was first past the post boost. And I've also on this chart, I've like shown what's minority governments and what's majority governments. And the, the most, uh, you know, really interesting I actually found here is that whenever someone won a majority government, their first past the post boost was over 10%. Um, in some cases, it was much higher. Um, and it's proportional to the percentage of the vote. So in 1958, when Diefenbaker won, he won 53% of the vote, but he got 78% of the seats. That is a first past the post boost value of 24%. So if you had a proportional representation system, he would have gotten 24% less seats. Um, which is huge, 24%. That is absolutely huge. Now, that's a pretty extreme example. But what we noticed here when I looked at these numbers is when a party actually did manage to win more than 50% of the vote, uh, which happened in 84 under Mulroney and in 58 under Diefenbaker, interesting that that turned out to be conservatives, um, you got basically the same values with uh, Mulroney. Mulroney won 50% of the vote, 74.8% of the seats. Once again, 24.8% boost from uh, the percentage of votes he actually got compared to the percentage of seats. So when I start looking at this, we kind of have to figure out, okay, well, who does this benefit? Well, typically it tends to benefit liberals more because our political system typically tends to benefit the Liberals more, right? If we had a proportional representation system that would favor the Greens, NDP more, our first past the post system favors the Liberals. It actually favors the Bloc Québécois the most because if we had a proportional representation system, the Bloc, there's absolutely no way the Bloc could do what they did in the last election because the Bloc Québécois only runs candidates in Quebec. And because of that, um, under first past the post, if they're able to get 8% of the vote or whatever, they'll get a good chunk of seats. Whereas if you had a proportional representation system, um, they would get a lot less. So their first past the post boost is usually going to be pretty large because they're a regional based party and parties that are strong regionally um, typically tend to have 
uh, like be benefited by first past the post. The conservative party is kind of in this weird zone where they benefit from first past the post, but they don't always benefit from it. So this is where it gets complicated, right? Because the liberals typically tend to always usually benefit from our electoral system and from first past the post. The conservatives are kind of in the middle ground. The Bloc Québécois typically tends to benefit from it a lot, the most, usually. And then the NDP and the Green Party get screwed over the most by this system because they have national-wide support, but it's kind of like the Green Party, it's like 6% across Canada, or the NDP, it's 50%, sorry, 15% across Canada. And because of that, since they don't have these regional areas that they're dominant in, that doesn't translate into seats as well. So because of that, when we um, analyze what's happening here, it gets, it gets a little bit more complicated because minority governments still give you a first past the boost value, but it's usually less. And the pattern, like I just said here, I notice is that literally it's really simple. When a political party won a majority um, post-1958, they got a first past the post boost value of more than 10%, so double digits. Their percentage of seats, percentage of uh, the vote translated into percentage of seats, they got more than a 10% boost. Whereas minority governments typically tend to get less values. There's a couple outliers. Uh, that being Trudeau in 2019 and uh, the 1979 election. But besides that, basically when you're looking at this, the first past the post values in minority governments are much lower. Um, if we look at an example here, in uh, 2006, uh, minority government was won with 36.3% of the vote. That translated into 40.3% of the seats which is a 4% boost. That's the smallest uh, percentage boost, I believe. Oh, except for one. That's the second smallest percentage boost for seats. And, you know, what basically what I'm getting to here is, well, what does this mean? Well, it means that if you fall into the category of getting, like, somewhere between, like, upper 30s percent of the vote of registered voters in Canada... Uh, like upper 30s, I think the value here I'm looking at is kind of like above 37%. Well, it, it gets complicated because there's some outliers, but basically if you're above 40% of the vote, first past the post gives you a really disproportionate boost to getting more seats in parliament. And this is not only just first past the post, this obviously also contributes. Part of this is the regional distribution of seats in Canada. And if I were to look at the regional distribution of the seats to these different areas, I would see instances of examples. The reason why this ends up happening is that areas where, like, you know, let's say the Liberals win a riding with 33% um, of the vote and the Conservatives get 27% of the vote. Well, that 27% essentially has no say in democracy, right? Because their 27, their candidate lost, it, it means nothing. Right? It doesn't help other writings. It doesn't, that's it. That 27%, just you, those people didn't get what they want. And because of that, um, those specific examples, when they happen, help contribute to a larger pattern, basically, of how you get a disproportionate boost. And you see that those small elections at a writing level, all those votes that basically just go to waste, when you add those up, that's what contributes to the first past the post boost or not. And uh, if we look at Mulroney uh, back in 1984, um, that was a really significant win because in a bunch of areas, if you go back in areas in Quebec and uh, areas um, across Canada, the progressive conservatives did that a lot, right? They've won some narrow... Uh, leads, they beat some liberal stronghold areas, um, all those factors contributed to that, and then that's how you end up with a 24% boost and a, basically a disproportionate value of percentage of the vote compared to percentage of the seats. Um, 
the way to fix this is essentially change the electoral system because there tends to be a clear inherent bias and a problem. This value, this first past the post value is bad for Canadian democracy because it gives parties a disproportionate amount of power for what Canadians actually voted for. But the issue here is how does that happen? Well, that's the speech about electoral reform is what it's called. I'm going to get more into it in a second here. But the biggest issue with that is, well, the Liberals are usually in power and they don't, they're they not going to get rid of the electoral system that <laughs> um, benefits them, right? Like I remember back in 2015, Trudeau pledged to change the electoral system. And I said back in 2015, I was way younger, I said, this isn't going to happen. And like many things with Trudeau, I predicted it right. I predicted a week before he did the stupid kneeling stunt, I said, oh, Trudeau, I bet you he's going to go to the fucking protest. And guess what? He ended up going. So it, it actually looks like I tend, to, I tend to be right about a lot of things. But, um, okay, that sounds super conceited. But I'm right about this. But when we go back and look at Trudeau and the Liberals, they purposely chose, they had the power, they had a majority government in 2015, they chose to not go out and change Canada's electoral system because it wouldn't benefit them. And they made this committee, they included some people from a bunch of different parties, and the conclusion they basically came to was that, uh, oh, we don't want, Canadians don't want electoral reform, which is absolute bullshit. Um, they're... they're <laughs> They basically tried to argue that Canadians like didn't know enough about the system and because of that electoral reform didn't go through, but a lot of Canadians do. The issue is just a lot of liberals don't want the system to change because then they won't win as much, right? And we've seen this be manifested at the provincial level in BC. They've tried to get proportional representation a bunch of times, but it hasn't gone through because a lot of the liberals don't want it to. And then you get into the conservatives where it's like you're in a tricky spot here because Historically, in the the older post-war governments, the conservative governments of Diefenbaker, Mulroney, those governments really benefited from first-past-the-post boost. But more recent governments, Harper governments, the conservatives kind of usually fall into this category in Canada where they're usually either opposition or they or they might win a majority, right? And it, you usually see support for the conservatives. It, it can be anywhere from like... 20% to uh, sometimes more, sometimes it goes up to mid 30s and stuff like that. And when you look at Harper, well, his elections were always kind of tricky, right? Because um, in 2006, 2008, 2011, in 2011, the Harper government got a majority government and they didn't deserve it. Um, the, the, the other thing I actually forgot to mention, the most significant thing I found from this little investigation I did is that a lot of times, the first past the post boost can boost a party from being, from basically when you have a party that has less than 50% of the vote, the first past the boost can boost them into a majority. And that's really significant because in almost every case, except for Diefenbaker and except for Mulroney in 1984, every other majority government in Canada post-1958, did not win a majority of the votes in Canada. They won less, and sometimes well less, right? 43%, 41%, 38%, 40%. These are a bunch of different values that the Canadian government won a majority government from having a minority of the votes. So they got 100% of the power with 38.5% of the vote in 1997 under Jean Chrétien. They end up getting 51.5% of the seats. Well, that's a 13% boost. Guess what? That made the difference of Jean Chrétien's government being a minority and a majority government. That helped him become a majority government. And it's because of this that conservatives kind of tend to be on the fence about the issue of first past the post. Liberals, the grits, whatever you want to call them, Liberal Party of Canada, they typically tend to favor first past the post. And if not first past the post, they'll tell you, oh, okay, we'll do a ranked ballot system, which is like the next best thing for them, where um, you rank your votes and a candidate usually has to get like a certain percentage of the vote to win in a certain riding. Still kind of like first past the post, but um, because of that, 
uh, you know, let's say you're in Justin Trudeau's writing, he has to win by a certain margin. And if he doesn't win, then you go to, okay, we're going to include everyone's second choices. So with that, it's like, okay, I might go out and vote for, you know, Jagmeet Singh, but if Jagmeet Singh doesn't win, okay, my third choice is Justin Trudeau. Now, that's not me. I just wouldn't fill in that. But that's how a lot of other electoral systems work across the world. Uh, Australia has that. Um, France sort of has that. They have a majority runoff system. But basically, um, the liberals always support first past the post. And if they don't, they typically tend to support ranked ballot systems, which still favor them. But they don't favor them as much because in Canada, we know that if someone votes for a liberal or a conservative, a lot of the times that's not their actual political beliefs or what they actually support. If a lot of times when people vote liberal, their second choice is Green Party or their second choice is NDP. Or if you're conservative, they you might vote for the conservative party, but your second choice might be the People's Party of Canada. Or it might be, I don't know, one of the like Christian, smaller Christian parties or stuff like that. Um, but it's really important to keep in mind here that uh, first past the post stays here because of the liberals, essentially. And the other part of it is because conservatives are kind of divided on the issue. Because if I was a conservative strategist, you kind of have to factor in, well, okay, conservatives are kind of at a disadvantage with Canada's electoral system. Liberals tend to win. But the times the conservatives do win, the first past the post system does help us and it does boost us to a majority. Stephen Harper in 2011 got 39% of the vote but 54% of the seats and that's because of a 14.5% first past the post boost. So if Canada had proportional representation in 2011, Harper would have won a minority government. He wouldn't have won a majority government. So this is where conservatives kind of get, you know, antsy with this here is because some support electoral reform some don't um i believe the last time it came up when people were talking about it i think the conservatives wanted to have a referendum over it i think that that was their contribution to the committee about changing canada's electoral system um it, it really depends with conservatives right because right now they would benefit from a proportional system and actually in um 2019 the Conservatives got more votes than the Liberals did, and they won the 2019 election. Now, I don't like the Conservatives. I don't like the Liberals either. I don't like them both. But if you were a Conservative person, that would be very upsetting to see the party you voted for um, get more votes and not win because of Canada's electoral system. And that kind of really shifted attitudes in the Conservative Party about proportional representation, because if you had proportional representation there, Trudeau wouldn't have won the 2019 election, and that's pretty significant. Um, it's difficult. This is a very difficult subject because the NDP and the Greens are usually always pro-proportional representation because they get fucked over all the time. The blocks are usually first past the post because it helps them. So because of that, you kind of get this gridlock that nothing has really changed. There hasn't been any kind of like concrete plans or any kind of sentiment to like change Canada um, and change our, you know, electoral system. There's been different movements, but no government has ever really taken it seriously. And I don't expect the Liberals to ever do it because why would they change the system that benefits them? The Conservatives, it's difficult because, you know, through different periods of history, it can benefit or it can't benefit them, right? During the Harper era, during the start of the Harper era, um... Harper won minority governments, he got boosts from first past the post, but he didn't get enough boost to win a majority. So to kind of analyze this from like a mathematical perspective here, we look at Harper in 2008, he won 37.7% of the vote, he got 46.4% of the seats. Well, in 2011, he got 39.6% of the vote, which translated to 54% of the seats. So this is this is how significant the voting margins are is that you know it's like what is this like two per two percent he got two percent more votes in 2011 and that was the difference between a majority and a minority now obviously here like i said before it's not just like you get 39 percent of the vote you can't compare 39 and 37 percent of the vote there 
just at a broad perspective, you have to look at, okay, you have to look at the different ridings across Canada and go, okay, here's where he got screwed over. He lost by 500 votes here. And that contributes to how the different values happen here. Because what would have happened is with the 37%, it's not like there's a threshold of like 39%, then you're going to get a significant boost of 14% boost. And then 37%, you don't get a significant boost. Um, you have to kind of it's like an it's like a fucking algebraic thing here you have to do but you have to accommodate for the fact that different writings have different patterns in different elections and that basically what ends up happening is that it's not just two percent of a difference can have you know the difference of a significant difference in first past the post you have to actually look at the writings and figure out how you know that oh they lost this one by 500 votes they won this one because that's the other issue if you win by a significant margin that creates a different disproportionate value here too, right? Because if you're conservative and you win um, an Alberta riding by, you know, you, you get 40% of the vote or something, um, that kind of also factors to this. It's not just losing by margins, it's how much you win by in other margins. That contributes to the percentage of the vote you get. And it's kind of like a winner takes all system because whoever gets the most votes in the, in the riding wins and that can work for you or that can work against you. And you have to accommodate both of those factors into when you look at, you know, oh, 37.7% of the vote, where does that vote come from? Uh, you know, did you lose a lot of ridings and you underperformed or did you win a lot of ridings and overperform because of first past the post? So that sounds really complex, but um, I'm pretty sure that's that's something that people can uh, wrap their heads around because it's it's not it's not like you know incredibly complicated math or anything it's just you know percent values it's just percentage of the vote and percentage of the seats and how do how does that stuff relate to each other but in short here just to finish off i'll say about the conservatives it's really tricky because if you're a conservative policy analyst you know well okay back in 2011 you're pro first past the post because that brought harper to a majority government that he if he did not if we had a PR system, he not he would have not won. But in 2019, you literally won more votes than Trudeau did as a conservative party, but you lost because Trudeau in 2019 got a 13.3% first past the post boost value, which actually is quite um, uncharacteristic. That was kind of an outlier, right? Because Trudeau only got 33.1% of the vote and he ended up with 46.4% of the seats. But he got a pretty high first past the post boost in 2019, which gave him a pretty wide, you know, like there's a pretty big discrepancy there. 33% of the vote, 46% of the seats. Um, but the conservatives, you could also do this in reverse, right? You could take, um, <laughs> it's interesting actually, I just realized that, but you could take the conservative party and you got 33 point i don't know what was it 33.7 percent or 34 percent of the vote a slight amount more votes than trudeau i think it was about ten thousands in the tens of thousands maybe hundreds of thousands i don't remember that's not important though but you could do this in reverse you could do first past the post um not boost i don't know what the other first past the post screwed over value let's call it let's call it that um first past the post screwed over value that how much negative percentage you lose, right? So if the conservatives got like 33.7% of the vote, but they only got, I don't actually remember how that translated, but they got less than obviously 46% of the seats. They got less uh, value and then it would be kind of, it could also be a negative value or it could also just be a less of a factor there, right? Because you could have 33% um, of the vote, the conservatives still got a boost but not as much of a boost um, than Trudeau did, right? Because if the Conservatives got 33, let's just say 34% of the vote, well, it all depends on what percentage of the seats they got. Okay, so I actually just did a little bit of quick research here because I, I wanna just not be talking out of my ass here since I kind of just arrived upon a new um, research thing I could have done here, but so in the 2019 election, Andrew Scheer won 34.34% of the vote. 
And in seats, he won 35.7, well, 35.8 percent of the seats. So he did get a slight increase. That's like a one point something percentage first past the post boost. But Trudeau got a 14 percent boost, right? So because of that, you're it's not a negative value for Andrew Scheer because once again, the Canadian system does favor the Liberals and the Conservatives. The Liberals, the most, the Conservatives to a degree, it depends on the election. But you're looking at an election where Trudeau got a 13% boost, almost 14%, and Andrew Scheer got like a 1% boost. And that's why the Conservatives won more of the percentage of the vote, but had a significant amount less seats, right? Because you're looking at the Conservatives have uh, 35% of the seats, while the Liberals have 46%. That's a huge difference. Um, but I don't know if the Conservative Party and the culture would get angry enough to change and want proportional representation because they might their next candidate might be able to beat Trudeau if there's another narrow margin it might favor them next time it's less likely to and that's something um that I can investigate more in the future if I were to look at this but it could benefit them in the way that it benefited Harper in 2011 or the way it benefited Mulroney now the conservative party has changed a lot um the way Mulroney won isn't going to happen now because the conservative party doesn't win in Quebec like they used to um Harper, you saw him kind of sweep. He did very well across the country. And so the conservatives, from a strategy point, it's it's. I'm curious to see what they'll do in the future because it's a pretty complicated um, like path they have to go down of weighing. If you're a conservative policy analyst, then you kind of have to weigh, okay, well, where do we think, the, not only the next election, but where in the next 20 years do we think Canadians are going to go with voting? Because... You know, if support for the conservatives is like around, you know, above 35%, you're going to want to keep first past the post. But if it's below that, you might, you would probably consider a different system because it might, might benefit you more. Um, but overall, like we just saw with Andrew Scheer, he, he got fucked over in this case very specifically. Um, but at the same time, if they had proportional representation, all it would mean is that... Um, he would have more seats in parliament, but he wouldn't have won under proportional representation. So that's kind of the other difficulty. I've talked about the conservative party a lot here, but this is the, the most um, interesting example of first past the post because the liberal, like I said, the liberals, it benefits them. Green party, NDP, it doesn't uh, block, it benefits them. The conservatives, it, it kind of, it more so benefits them than it doesn't benefit them. But they also, in like this example and other elections, they're also on the receiving end of, they don't get as much of a boost as the Liberals typically do. And that usually relate results in them not losing seats from first past the post in a percentage value, but not gaining as much as the Liberals do. So that just puts it into a really weird category where if I were to predict it, my opinion as a policy analyst, I don't think... The conservatives will support a different type system. They won't support rank ballot system because I don't think that'll benefit them. There, there are some people who support proportional representation. I find it very curious that conservatives weren't more angry at the last election that Scheer got more votes than Trudeau did. Um, but I think that goes back to, I think a lot of conservatives don't necessarily care about democracy in that sense. They care more so about in the future, they have the foresight to see you know, they don't like this system because it fucked them over this time, but they realize that any successful conservative government has usually been really, this system really helps them. So I think that's why you don't see people getting as angry. Because um, in the States, we see a lot of people get angry of uh, Hillary Clinton that she won, she beat Donald Trump by like 3 million votes. And because the way that system works, um, Trump ended up winning. But in Canada, I didn't see the same kind of anger. I didn't really see any... I, there's some conservatives I see who support pro pro proportional representation, but there's not really like a movement to firmly change it. And that's that's my opinion why uh, I think that happens. But basically, to kind of wrap this all together, um, I ended up just kind of merging the third topic when I was talking about the, the research I did for my term paper. But... When it really comes down to it, um, 
it's kind of your choice now as the viewer of what kind of electoral system you want, right? Because there's a bunch of different alternatives. Um, primarily the main alternative being proportional representation, which means that if the Green Party wins 7% of the vote, they get 7% of the seats in parliament. Um, there's ranked ballot where people, it's kind of similar to what we do, but you rank your choices. And if your first choice doesn't get in, then maybe your second or your third choice gets in. Um, there's some more, there's other ones like, um, there's more complicated ones like the Van Hollen system. And there's all these like ones in Europe that have like all these like kind of algebraic equations that um, are kind of somewhere in the middle ground. Uh, it, it gets complicated. Democracy and electoral politics is a complicated thing. You can literally take a fourth year course on it like I did um, last semester. And that's not even mentioning stuff like the Senate in Canada, right? Because the Senate isn't democratically elected. And if the Senate was democratic, you would have a completely different political culture in Canada because you would have two houses that could be elected. Um, I usually typically tend to support just abolishing the Senate. Um, I think the Conservatives actually supported that. I think Stephen Harper supported that. Uh, he wanted to do it, but he couldn't do it because he uh, he he was an idiot. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I'm, I'm not kidding, actually. But he... I forget. Oh, uh, Harper, it was because he... Um, the, there was going to be issues because to change the to make this to get rid of the Senate you would have to have a constitutional amendment and that would involve the provinces and the provinces didn't want to talk to him so that's that is that's it never went anywhere but despite the fact that a lot of Canadians actually support getting rid of the Senate uh, the NDP did the Conservatives sort of did at once um, the Liberals kind of support it because the Senate kind of kind of helps them they've Liberals Trudeau's tried to reform the Canadian Senate to uh, basically make it less partisan um he got rid of you you can't really be a liberal in the senate anymore um but the senate it's i don't know it's fucking stupid it's an appointed position thing it's not democratic i don't want stuff that's not democratic um i don't care about the stupid british monarchy or whatever system uh ours is based off of in britain i want a democratic system that accurately represents the the people who are a part of that state and i don't think that having unelected officials being appointed into the Senate is a good thing. And that you saw that being a scandal with John Turner, Brian Mulroney, um, Jean Gretchen, even Stephen Harper, the senators they appointed, you're usually gonna appoint senators that favor you. And Trudeau's changed it a bit. He's made it a little bit better because he has kind of made it less partisan. It used to be a big problem in the past, um, but now it's, we're just at this weird point where I feel Canadian democracy really isn't, um, you know, like, our system's not flawed in the sense that, like, you know, it's not like we have an act of war or, like, just huge voter suppression like you see in, like, certain, like, Latin American or, like, different countries in uh, Asia or Africa or even different parts of Europe. Um, Canada doesn't have the same kind of, like, voter suppression or, like, authoritarian fascist um, kind of tendencies that those countries do. But at the same time... Canada kind of lags behind other democratic systems, especially in Europe, especially like um, different parts of Europe. Um, our system's a lot less democratic. Uh, for example, you know, interesting thing I found with my research is uh, France, they have a Senate, um, but their Senate's actually voted on not by uh, the people, but by municipal councillors. So like city councillors in France, um, you go out and they vote, you vote for your city councilor, and then they decide who goes into the Senate. I think that's an interesting thing. That's something you could do in Canada. Uh, probably, like, it'd be easier to change to that, at least for now, than, like, completely getting rid of the Senate, because that involves the provinces, that involves a big... Um, that would be... It would take a really big movement to do something like that. Though I support abolishing the Senate, I do recognize that um, it, it's tough to do in Canada. But... You know, there are alternatives like that. I remember uh, two semesters ago, we had a Canadian senator come into the class. And I think I told the story before, but I was I was a fucking douchebag. I, I basically asked him, like, what he thought about uh, getting rid of the Senate. And, uh, you know, if uh, what he thought about Canada adapting a different, you know, um, model similar to certain European countries. And actually, this guy, I was pretty surprised, he was 
more open to it than I expected because I basically just asked him a question that said like, you know, <laughs> I basically supported a policy that would involve him losing his job or um, him making it a lot more difficult for him to keep his job. But he actually was pretty like he gave he he gave an example of Germany. And then in my own research, I found out the example of France for like municipal councillors, um, you know, uh, elect the senators. And he actually said like he'd kind of be open to that and uh, and he'd be interested in a more like democratic process with that, which I actually I thought was pretty good because I, <laughs> I got a fucking Canadian senator to, uh, you know, kind of loosely admit that he's open to something like this but obviously that's one of the biggest issues about getting rid of the senate is it has to pass the senate right like to the legislation to get rid of the senate or to reform it has to pass the senate and you've got a bunch of people in the senate who don't want to lose their jobs because it's an easy job you get appointed you don't have to get elected you get like a bunch of assistance you get all your expenses covered you just show up to parliament sometimes you, you might talk sometimes you you can be fucking drunk all day it's not it's not like when you have to be elected right so because of that a, an important process of reforming the senate is actually and making it more democratic what i'm talking about here electoral politics an important part of doing that is actually finding a way to get the senate to agree to that and um that's that's kind of the way that i kind of i think i kind of you know kind of realized here that okay maybe we can't do the abolishing the senate in the near future especially under a liberal or conservative government but maybe we can reform the senate make it a little bit more democratic because at the end of the day i i you know I, I have my beliefs i want to get rid of the senate or just make it completely uh democratic but at the end of the day if i can improve something versus not improving it i'll take the reform over nothing and um I thought that was pretty interesting when he actually when he responded to my question that way because I was I was being a little bit of a dick when I asked that question I was, I was being a little bit dickish I wasn't rude but it, it, the question kind of ventured into the dickish territory there but the last thing I'll say kind of wrapping everything together about electoral politics is it's a very complicated subject um, it's not you know it's something you can look more into if you want to look more into it. Just go and look up electoral politics on uh, Wikipedia. Go look up first past the post on Wikipedia, and then you can see all the different... I didn't go into all the different kinds, because there's literally, like, in my class, we spent, like, weeks learning, like, all these different advanced systems, and I had to learn how to, like, calculate uh, under certain systems, like, how this stuff works, and, like, the, you know, different types of people who support those systems, and, like, how those connect to broader political philosophies and stuff like that. It was really complicated but it was i really liked that course and i did really well in it i got an a in it and i think more people would benefit from taking now obviously not the fourth year political science course about electoral politics you have to be in political science to understand it but i think in high school you could take kind of what i just talked about anyone can understand i'm not i'm not discussing you know the really advanced theories and and asking people to learn equations and stuff like that um, I'm just talking about kind of a broad introduction to electoral politics, how systems work, how our systems work, how it could be changed, um, what outcomes actually happen from our system. And I think that's something that a lot of people could really benefit from because a lot of people, the problem with politics in Canada, a lot of places around the world, people are busy, they got work, uh, a lot of people finish high school or finish their education, and they don't do any more education. And I think that that's unfortunate, a lot of people are busy, a lot of people are tired, but I do always support education. That's part of the reason why I do this podcast is to help contribute to um, kind of the public discourse on topics in, in politics and political science. But I really do think that there's a lot of uh, ways you can make stuff more accessible to an average person that's better for everyone. It's not, it's not even really a partisan thing or an ideo ideological thing. I just want more people to make sure that they know more about politics and the electoral system and stuff like that because if you go to a workplace or i go to a place and i start talking about first past the post you'd be surprised at the amount of canadians who don't even really understand how our political system works because i believe in ontario you study it briefly in grade five and then that's it you don't talk about it again you take civics but civics is not civics is not political science civics is not it's not even really like how does it work that well like i remember i i took civics in high school i literally got a fucking hundred in the course actually yeah 
It's embarrassing. I actually had above a hundred mark because it was um, uh, there was bonus questions. So I actually had like it was like a hundred and point nine or something in the course, but you couldn't you couldn't put that on the report card. But I actually had above a hundred in civics. It's it's rather embarrassing when I look back at it now. But um, that being said, though, is I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done more than civics and if you're listening to this podcast obviously you're the type of person who wants to learn more about politics and i think that that's a really good thing regardless of what political background people come from it's really important to learn more about politics the more educated you become the better it is for society the more you know you learn about just different topics the better it is for society um and that being said that's where it's important where you, the listener, comes in because it's your choice to decide how do you feel about first past the post. Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? Do you think it's shitty? I think it's shitty. Uh, I think it should be improved. I think it should be changed. But maybe you don't. And hopefully at the end of the day, more people can educate themselves and also educate others, pass it on, family members, friends, co-workers, and people explain this stuff, uh, make it easier to understand because a lot of people don't understand what electoral politics is and how to reform it, how our system works, how other systems work, what are the advantages, what are the negatives, you know, proportional representation, there are negatives to it too, right? Um, there's advantages and negatives to everything. It's important to be a well-informed person. And at the end of the day, it is your decision as a listener to figure out whether you like first past the post or proportional representation or ranked ballot. Um, there's a lot of resources. If you want to learn more about it, uh, there's proportional representation. I think it's called fairvote.ca. You can learn more stuff about it. Just literally go on Wikipedia. I know Wiki Wikipedia is not the best, but for a basic um, kind of introduction to something, if you don't want to read a fucking academic article on it, um, Wikipedia can be really helpful for if you want to learn the different types of systems we have across the world. Like I said, Google first past the post and then uh, look at there's a bunch of stuff in like within that article that talks about other systems and you can just mess around there. Uh, Fair Vote Canada talks about proportional representation in Canada. The government did have a report. You can probably just look up Canada um, first past the post committee or whatever it was called. You, it's, it's, it, you'll find a news article about it and stuff like that. They released a report and stuff. It's kind of long though. Um, it's easier to listen to something like a podcast than it is like that. But there are many ways you can um, expand your knowledge on this kind of stuff. Quite easily, just Google search. You spend 20 minutes to learn more about this stuff. Um, I do think it's really important because we don't really talk about electoral systems in school. And we don't talk about other stuff. This is all stuff I learned because I'm a fucking political nerd. And I look this stuff up myself. I listen to, like, podcasts. I, I do a bunch of stuff. But the average person, it's really hard to learn this stuff. And everyone has to start somewhere, right? And whether you're starting right from nothing or whether you're starting from a high area of knowledge, the most important part is... How is, you know, do you keep continue learning? And that's at the end of the day, what I really hope happens here with more people in Canada, because I swear to God, you know, when topics like first past the post come up uh, at different jobs I've worked and like people literally do not understand like how voting works. Um, it's kind of, it, to me, it's kind of like, wow, like that's such a failure on our education system that like people don't understand the basic concepts of our voting system. That's really not good and the fact that we do like quadratic equations in high school and people don't understand the basics of our society that's pro that's if you ask me that's a pretty big problem um that's it for today's episode uh i finally got this one done i've been planning it for a while um hopefully the part about the different types of uh first past the post boosts and the research i did was interesting to learn i'll uh, probably attach that stuff on the on twitter on instagram stuff like that uh, next episodes, like I've said, I mentioned before, I'll be quick here because this has been a long fucking podcast, but I have m mentioned before the different topics I'd like to do in the future. Um, one of them, I think part of what I've been debating is do I stick to current events or do I stick to larger topics? And right now I typically tend to like larger topics, um, that are not really time sensitive because I've noticed people have been going back and listening to older episodes. And like, if you go back and I know me personally, if I go back and I listen to an episode from like January, right now it feels like, first off, it feels like it's 20 years ago because January, like Bernie Sanders was leading the polls and shit like that. But um, on top of that, you know, 
I don't think if people are going back, do you really want to hear about the, you know, Bernie Sanders or um, Joe Biden, like the earlier stuff? We already know what happens. It's like, that's kind of very time based. I don't really like listening, going back and listening to podcasts that are like all about a certain, you know, like I, I, there are podcasts you can listen to. It's like you listen to them a year or two later and like basically everything they say is still relevant. And that's what I'm trying to do here with this type of episode is this is a subject that d doesn't have a time limit. And you could listen to this three years from now. If there is anyone listening to it three years from now, um, it's pretty timeless. And that's that's the goal, I think, of where I'm going to head with the podcast in the future. So I'm going to take, it involves more research, but the trade-off for me, at least, is that covering current events, especially with, like, my schedule, because I just, I have, like, so many courses right now. They're all condensed. I have, like, millions of things due for school. I've got, you know, work and just other stuff to do that... Um, it's difficult to stay on top of current events in the sense of like reporting stuff like that. Um, I find it's easier to just research a broad topic like this. That being said, the next episode I think will be about Brian Mulroney. I'm going to do kind of like a summary of his biography. There's a really good book with a lot of great quotes where he calls the Canadian press gallery ancestral. I think that could be fun. Uh, I've got a remix already planned. I've already got it made. I think that's where I'm heading next episode. I want to talk about Brian Mulroney. Um, and then in the rest of the summer, uh, I really do plan on um, doing an, ep an entire episode about the conservative leadership, an entire episode about the green leadership race. I think I'm also going to try and do a YouTube video. We'll see. We'll see who I can get on the podcast. I'm making some progress on that. We'll see how that works out. Um, but I will be making a YouTube video probably, or at least some posts in a shorter condensed uh, kind of introducing people to the candidates and... Uh, with the conservative one and the Green Party one, I'm my goal is I'm going to put them all on a political spectrum. And I'm going to kind of use my knowledge of politics and my policy analyst skills. I'm going to take those. And ideally, you know, you would make a, a table and then quantify like a number and you would um, make a value and you would have like, okay, like it being, you know, th how, you know, if I was looking at the conservatives, I look at, you know, how much do they support um, anti-abortion measures? And then I'd give them a numerical value, I'd average it out, and then place them on a political spectrum of, of social and economic. I don't think I, I can do that because two reasons. Um, it's hard to get leaders positions on everything in a leadership like race because in Canada they're pretty small, they're pretty beef, brief, low budget. Um, it's kind of hard to actually find where candidates stand on a lot of things. And that's why I'm doing this kind of journalism because I really think I could help people understand it better because CBC... Uh, the other places, it's garbage. It's really hard to tell. When you when there's a leadership race, the first thing you want to know is, okay, where does this person sit on the political spectrum? Who are they? And you have to do all that work and labor yourself. The journalists don't do a good enough job of showing you. You know, it's kind of obvious to some degree, like with the conservative leadership race, okay, Peter McKay is not super socially conservative, and Derek Sloan is super socially conservative. That's kind of obvious, but... Other things like differences between candidates on like other issues, it's, it's it's hard to tell. And you as a voter, people say, oh, go out and do your research. No, I'm telling you as a person who studied political science, it's difficult. It's time consuming. It's not easy to figure out which candidate in a leader. It's easier in a major election because there's more coverage and stuff like that. But in a leadership race, it's really hard and time consuming to figure out which candidate is the candidate you like the best. And the way I look to help with this is non-biased, or right? I'll make some jokes and, uh, you know, I'll give my opinions in a different segment, but I'm not going to, you know, skew my political spectrum to, like, make a certain candidate look bad. I'm going to represent the truth because that's what I care about, the truth and democracy and stuff like that. And I want to put those candidates on a spectrum that people can look at and kind of go, okay, here's where I think I fit on it. Uh where which candidate is closest to me and then go from there as a starting point because a lot of people don't do that and a lot of people right now just expect you as a listener or you as a media consumer to do that on your own a lot of people are busy people are working there's a fucking pandemic there's a lot going on right now and it's very difficult to find that stuff out and that's where i hope to help with this i wish I could do it as a full-time job as a journalist because I do think I am confident in my skills of being able to do this and I am also confident in my skills of not only being able to create a political spectrum and um, you know 
find that information, but I have worked pretty hard over the years of being able to communicate that information in an effective way. So it might be through a meme, it might be through a music video, it might be through a meme remix, but if I can communicate those legitimate political science, you know, journalism type uh, stuff, if I can communicate that through an easy and fun way to understand, that's my ultimate goal here. And a lot of CBC stuff that's dry or election coverage, CTV, it's fucking dry, it's boring, um, it's not exciting, or they expect you to watch an entire debate. My goal here is, and if I could do this as a job, would be to watch the debate myself and pass on the most important information onto you so that you can make an informed choice. Because right now, Canadian political journalism around leadership debates, it sucks. It's Election coverage is bad to begin with, but leadership coverage sucks. Like the Green Party had a debate the other day. No one covered it. And I know some people are like, oh, the Green Party is a piece of shit. But still, some kind of journalism journalist should cover that, right? Like that, that is important. Um, and at, at the end of the day, I really think there's ways to improve that. Hopefully, that's what I hope to do here is improve that, make it easier to understand, and save you time. If I do that labor of figuring out where the candidates fit, then you can look at a graph and get, you know, you can you can spend two hours watching the leadership debate, or you can look at the two political spectrums I create of social and economic where people fit, and you can look at you can find out the same information in like a minute compared to two hours. And that's my problem with Canadian politics is that they put so much labor on an individual person. It's so time consuming. It's so boring. No one wants to be interested in this. But if you make it less time consuming, you make it more exciting, you make it more interesting, more people will get involved in politics. More people will be educated in politics. They'll care more. Because to be honest here, my final point here, a lot of people who vote in these leadership conventions, they don't even fucking know the candidates, right? A lot of people just go in and it's like, oh, this guy's got a, you know, last name similar to me. I'm going to go vote for him. I like the way this guy dresses. That's how Canadians vote. And me, it's frustrating me because I remember being a kid talking to adults about why they voted for people. And they'd be like, some people like, oh, like, I like, this guy's a good dresser. Or like, oh, and as a teenager, people like, Justin Trudeau's got good hair. And like, that's literally why they voted for him. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sakes, like... Please just do some research. Please do something. Please stop voting for people based on their hair. It's terrible. But that being said, I'll finally finish up here. This was a very long episode, but this is a topic that I could do multiple episodes on. This is a very complicated topic of electoral politics, and it's very interesting stuff. I'm interested in it, at least. Um, I do plan on, in the future, making more condensed versions of this stuff, because not everyone wants to listen to a podcast. Like I've said before, I don't expect people to sit around and listen to me talk for an hour and a half. I suggest when you're doing podcasts, I know some people have said like they they listen to it when they're working, or they listen to it when they're doing homework, or for me, I put on Bluetooth headphones, I do chores. Uh, I do my dishes, I clean around the house, I do laundry. And to me, that's a really effective way of using my time because it's like, okay, I'm not doing anything else right now. I've got to do household labor. I'm going to, you know, learn something new today. I'm going to listen to a podcast or I'm going to listen to a comedy podcast. I usually listen to political comedy podcasts, but I'm going to learn something today and use my time more efficiently. So I'm not just sitting here fucking staring at dirty dishes or something, right? But that is, I do really want to like say that, that I don't expect people to just sit here and listen to it for an hour because that's that's a pretty boring listen if you ask me. I, I don't know if I could I could just sit in the same spot and listen to someone talk for an hour and a half. But that being said, uh, I went over some of the plans I have uh, for the rest of the summer. Uh, I do plan to make a video at some point, like I said, for the leadership races and stuff like that. Um, hopefully I'll have some people on and I'll do a Brian Mulroney episode in combination with those things, that'll probably take it. That'll be like the next two months. That'll probably be uh, the rest of the summer probably for that. But that being said, um, thanks for listening. If you made it this far, congrats. This is a really long podcast. Um, thanks again to Miss Raj for being the first person to person. First person to support the podcast. Like I said, uh, this podcast actually isn't sponsored by the Flat Earth Lobby. That was just a joke. Um, but thanks to Miss Raj for supporting the podcast um and if anyone else would like to support the podcast even if it's literally like a dollar a month that 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 helps um because uh to host a podcasting platform you have to pay a monthly fee to store the information um and there's obviously like other stuff involved with podcasts and i would eventually like to make this more of like a professional 
podcast. If I could sit and spend like six hours working on this, I could make this much better. I do have the skills. I do have the music, the editing, the research skills to do that. It's just, it, I don't have six hours to spend doing something like this. I basically just record it, edit it, and ship it out as fast as I can. But that being said, thank you for listening to the Bedrino Politics podcast. Uh, the next episode will be about Brian Mulroney. I've got a really good remix lined up and, uh, I've got some kind of images I'm going to prepare for it too. Some memes and stuff. It should be pretty good. Um, I'm going to be talking about his biography, which is really hilarious. He says fucking it. He says other stuff. It's actually a really good book. I'll, I'll basically just be summarizing the book and summarizing Mulroney's career. Um, but thanks for listening. Like I said, if you want to support the show, support the show on Patreon or just share stuff, tweet stuff. That really helps me. Uh, get views and stuff like that and have a good rest of your week and uh, try not to fall down a ramp like Trump did okay I take that back fuck CNN was stupid I, I, last thing here CNN was stupid for doing that I'm sorry but I, I hate Trump but like it's very clear he was the remix at the start of the episode he was just going down the ramp because it he, People are saying, like, oh, he's, he, he can't walk. No, it's because he, he was wearing those shoes. I I have leather bottom shoes I used to wear too. And I've fallen on campus before in shoes like that. They're very hard to, to walk in. And like everyone's like, oh, Trump's, you know, walking down the ramp. Like, oh, he, he can't do that. Oh, he can't drink of water. And it's like Trump, the problem with that is when you throw shitty things like that that don't make sense, Trump's able to defend himself because he said, I was just walking down the ramp. And uh, when he was talking about the tie, he's like, yeah, I didn't want to spill water on my tie. That's why I drank it like that. And the libs, the centrists, it's like they're, they're sitting here saying, like, oh, there's something wrong with Trump walking down the ramp. No, it's on an incline. I can see it. You can see it. Like, Trump wasn't lying. Personally, I, I don't like Trump at all. But you can see that he was walking down at an angle like that. I've done that before personally. If you don't believe me, get a pair of leather bottom shoes. They're very difficult to walk in, and I have fallen in them multiple times. Um, but lastly, the last thing I'll just say here is like people say that, and it's like Joe Biden is out here on speeches, like sitting, saying, like, I got hairy legs, and like, this is my sister, this is my wife, and he's like mixing them up. Like, if you're gonna attack Trump for like going down a ramp at a weird angle, what? How can you justify Joe Biden? Joe Biden's out here. He's like, oh, I'm running for United States Senate and vote for the other Biden. Like, <laughs> he doesn't know. Like, that's such a terrible argument. It's it's absolutely terrible. I don't understand why CNN and centrists do that. There's so much other stuff. If you want to criticize Trump, there's other stuff you can criticize him for. But the fact that that was a national story that he walked down the ramp at an angle is absolutely ludicrous and i i am willing to criticize the centrist media here because i hate the centrist media and that was just that was so stupid but here's the remix again you'll hear it again right here and uh if you, check out the facebook video i made of it too because i made a facebook video making fun of it but that's the, that's where the remix came from trump is telling the story about him going down the ramp and uh how the fake news covered it and stuff like that pretty funny story go check it out i'll see everyone next week I said, General, there's no way I can make it down that ramp without falling on my ass, General. Falling on my ass, General. It had no handrail. It was like an ice skating rink. So I took these little steps. I ran down because I'm wearing leather bottom shoes, which is good if you're walking on flat surfaces. It's not good for ramps. I'll tell you what, there's something wrong with biting that I can tell you.